So, but again, doing something randomly is not maybe as easy as, as it sounds. Yeah. And we really need to avoid having patterns in what we do. Um, what about the other night? And it's a good hazard Sorry? I did a sample of writing number one, then I did number seven. The two servers are number seven. Yeah. Number 13. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. So this is the this is the <coughs> very simple random sample. What you're alluding to is coming in a, in a second. And so population randomly pick four people from the population and you get this sound. And you see, you know, there's three greens here, and three blues here, and six reds here, and ideally our sample reflects that with two reds and one green and one blue being selected into the sample. Um, this is our little micro-population. In this case, there's 100 people in the class, numbered from 1 to 100. And then this is a table of random numbers. So what you do then is look at the two last digits here, for instance, and based on that, draw the people into your sample. Um, which again, let's look at the characteristics. So there's one, two, three, four, five females in here and five males, and that again reflects the distributions of 50 females and 50 males in the population. It's 25 random sample. Every member of the subgroup of the population has an equal chance to be represented in the sample. Um, let's stick to this example. So if you're interested in investigating and doing some research about people visiting the canteen, the cafeteria at the university, and you want to sample 50, um, 50 students from those 500 that you very regularly go there, right? So the 500 is your population, you're interested in 50, but you're interested also to have, to differentiate people that prefer ice cream to people that don't, that prefer chocolate. You want to, in the end, be able to maintain this, be very sure to maintain these characteristics and with a structural, um, structural similar, structurally similar in your sample. You want these, your sample to represent these proportions. Now, a good random sample should actually do that, but sometimes we could be interested to enforcing that, that our sample is actually doing that. Sorry, I'm still stuck to the that uh, uh, someone's using all, uh, I agree, they are still the random and they sample. But then, uh, we are having pain, we always uh, to uh, uh, look for the pattern where it becomes uh, easier to theorize. Uh, when, um, what, the way the, the sample responds to you has to read into pattern. So I'm, I don't know, I'm very confused. Of Once again, I'm not quite sure I understand the no, what so I'm saying is, uh, uh, there has to be randomness in a sample uh, selection. Yeah. But then, uh, it has to be into patterns. That's, that's what I've been training into. So, I, I don't know, I'm finding it will confuse But the patterns in the sample should be the same patterns in the population. Then you're saying there hasn't, and there should not be any pattern at all, right? No, there shouldn't be a pattern in how you randomly select. Right. The selection is totally random. But that leads to a sample which shares the same patterns, the same proportions, the same characteristics, the same structure as the population has. And I'll come to why that is the case. But, but it's not about the sample being everything being randomly distributed or distributed totally unequally or whatever. It's the randomness of the selection process that makes that we get a sample which is basically the same as the population. Again, sometimes that's very hard to achieve with a simple random sample, and sometimes we're interested in maintaining certain proportions in our sample, and that's why we would use stratified samples. So what we would first do is, in this case, split up the group of 500 students into the 100 people that like ice cream and the 400 people that like chocolate, almost the other way around. Um, yeah. And, an ice cream pot. and then from those groups, we randomly select proportional 
to the um, to the distribution of the population. So we randomly select 10 people from the ice cream likers, because we want to end up with 50, and we randomly select 40 people from the chocolate likers. Yeah, we maintain the proportions of the population, which are actually known in this case, or which we know. And, um, and then only sample from those subgroups. And we'll come to an example in a second where that has been partly applied as well, or where part of it was um, such a strategy. So yeah, our population looks a bit different because we can predefine the differences. There's the blues, there's the reds, there's the greens in this case. And then I want to maintain this proportion in my sample and again we'll select in this case one red, that one blue one green, two reds. But not randomly from the entire sample, but randomly within the groups. Which in this case, interestingly, of course leads to a very different, a very similar picture. And ideally, if you can truly randomize from the entire population, you should get the same picture. Sometimes it's <coughs> This is a kind of related way of doing things. And that's often happening when we do when, when people do face-to-face -face surveys um, for, for, survey, for bigger surveys. So these are streets and avenues and um, You've got a population of blocks, right? And from, the, from those you randomly, ideally, if you can, select the number of blocks that you're interested in. And the next step, you say, okay, within um, those blocks, I list all households that live within the block. Yeah? And then from all of those households in the different blocks, you can again randomly select the households that you're interested in. Sometimes six Work and it's easier because you don't need a full list of all our households in all blocks. Work prevents you from having to define the entire population beforehand by listing all out, then this list would be much longer and it would be much harder to get this list. But the big advantage is that here you only have to list those households that are the blocks that you already randomly selected. There's a mobile phone. Um, systematic random samples, I think, what, what you were getting at. Um, the idea again is very simple, very similar to a simple random sample because every subject of the population does have an equal chance to get into the sample, get selected into the sample. But we do so, and sometimes that's very handy to do, based on a random starting point and a random interval. So, I throw my dice, one to six, and that's my starting point for drawing a sample from this class. I start here. Um, this is my starting point, and then I draw, um, I, I, my dice gives it four. So it's one, two, three, four. I start my sample with you. You're the first member to be selected in the sample. And then I throw my dice again, and the dice turns out a three. Then I would select every third member of the group, starting with you. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Every one of you does have an equal chance to get selected into the group at the very beginning. Not of the first dice show anymore, because that includes those three orders. They're out. So do we need to uh, select this, uh, that gate number, which you decide, the number three, which you select yeah. by random draw? Not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Population and sample size. Yeah, it's, it's, it, that's a good point. Not necessarily. I mean, some, sometimes we would, and it has a bit more of a random view to it, 
but you could also define that beforehand. So what we often do when we analyze newspapers over a longer period of time, and one of the articles deals with that, by the way, in a way, is we randomly say, okay, I want to look at the Hindu Times in 2013. I randomly say which day of the week I start with. So, you know, it dies with seven numbers, ideally. Or is it on Sunday, published on Sunday in the Hindu Times? There is Sunday edition. Because yeah. that's also something you need to consider. Um, so a dice from 1 to 7, or a hat drawing from a hat from 1 to 7, and that gives me the weekday I start, which would be the Wednesday. And then I have predefined beforehand that I always add eight days. So I do the first Wednesday of the year. I do the Thursday in the following week. I do the Friday in the following week. I do the Saturday in the following week, and so on and so forth. Construct a week. I construct a week. And that, you know, on, based on that, you could construct weeks, you could construct months, if you look at 50 years, um, whatever you want. Like with the system, I can construct a week. I mean, uh, well, at some point it will, yeah. Because it's, uh, I mean, the constructed week is mostly based on this eight day interval because it always gets you a day further. Okay. Imagine you do a three-day three interval. It takes a bit longer until you have a width, but it's still a constructed week in the end because eventually you will have every weekday in the sample. Only if you have a seven, and put on a problem. Have you what? A continuous. If you do a continuous week, it's it's not a sample. You do the entire week, and then you have to think about what. What do you want to claim about, do you want to make claims about a bigger population or do you just want to talk about this week? I, this group here yesterday wanted to look at um, newspaper coverage one month before and one, half, one month after the election. That's fine, but then you need to be aware that your findings are about the difference between one month before and one month after the election. If you want to generalize bigger, then you need to think up different types of sampling strategies. Then you would take a year before and a year after and sample within that year, maybe. If you're doing a previous study, for example, yeah. if you do the construction of the week, how do you do that? Because uh, days of dates, what is important? Thursday of every uh, second week of March, or the date, how do you do the You define what you prefer you want to do and what you think is best to do if you want to answer your research question. And it, it's an interesting, I'm a bit hesitant to say this is the best method. Because, you know, it depends on how much funds you have, for instance. You know, you, you could say, I'm starting with the 1st of January and then always add 13 days. That's easier in a way because it's less material to analyze, it's going to be cheaper to do. If you've got more money, you say, I'm doing every fourth week, every fourth day. It, it really depends on. on on resources and research question. If it's important for you to have data from every week, at least, because you want to do some timelines, and then you at least need at least need one day from every week, I would think. If it's not important to you, it could be bigger the interval. But some sort of randomness would be nice. was he's interested in looking at newspaper coverage about certain issues and those issues only come up at certain periods of time. So yeah, naturally, I mean, if you could do a random sample, but you would probably miss a lot of information that would be very, very relevant for your study. So you'd rather go for a purpose of sample in that case, um, but that limits whatever you can say to those periods that you look at. And then you can, within that purpose of sample, still think about random sampling. So you say you've got two months here, two months here, two months here. You could still say that's too much. I can't do that much. So I only take every second day from each of those two month periods, which would indeed allow you to say something about the two month periods entirely. 
why not investigating the entire month? So it's, 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 I think it's often much easier with people than, than, than with content analysis stuff because there even more depends on the research interest that you have and on the resources and, 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 and so on and so forth. And often, I, I readily admit that often, if not most of the times, what we do in cultural analysis has some purposive element to it. Yeah. Identify by some parameters. So that's something to, to keep in mind and whether then within your purpose of, it's almost like you purposefully build up a new population from which you then could draw a sample. Um, so what is optimal stratified sample? <coughs> optimal stratified sample. That's sub uh, that's sub variations of the um, stratified sample in the way that you might think hard. Can you help me to rest? We go uh, in your graph. So if you look at the it's it's in, the, in this one, right? Oh, you know, it's there. Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, that's why you don't want to. I need to think a bit harder. That's why you don't want to uh, maintain the characteristics, the proportional distribution of characteristics in the population, um, but you want to come to some optimal comparison. So you would say that you um, um, I'm interested in comparing male and female students at this university. Yeah? Um, and the proportion as we said might be 60-40. So a proportional allocation would um, would be the one that we just talked about. In my sample I would maintain that proportion 60-40. Now I could say, you know, in resources, in my research interest, I want equal amounts of males and females in my sample in order to compare them well. In this case, it wouldn't matter much, but imagine the distribution of the population would be 10 to 90 percent. Then it would be very hard to say something about those few, few of the 10 percent rule. And I would optimize my allocation in order to say something about the differences by sampling more of this group and less of this group to the sample. Yeah. Uh, well, you were discussing this word, for example. And is it necessary to set the percentage? For example, you, for, your, for your purpose, you decide that there will be 10 percent uh, of the people who will be loving the chocolate and 40 percent will be loving the ice cream and rest 50 percent some other things. Is it necessary to set a percentage of all these groups to draw the sample from every no, no, it's, uh, it's every group? No, I think that would be proportionate allocation. No, it's 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 not because of you can't. Of we don't know what the distribution of the real population is. Um, but we know that, and we'll come to the Indian Indian case in a second. We know that certain districts or certain certain blocks, certain suburbs are characteristic of may be characteristic of something and important to be selected in one way or the other, to be included in the sample. Um, you know, if, if, if you do a survey in a small country, it's important to not, not just ask people in the city, but all in the country, and that could be a first stage of, of, um, of allocating people to different groups, because we want to make sure that even there's only a few people in the country that will be in the sample. For example, there are five groups of people who are different five groups of people. And for every group, we see the single newspaper, for example, the Hindu, the Amor, the NSX, the rest of the newspapers. Is it necessary to select, for example, if we have a population of uh, 1,000 people who are reading a group, uh, newspaper one, then second group, there are 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. We may not have an appropriate figure. Mm -hmm. Can we select, for example, the same number of uh, persons from each group? You could do that if you've got a very specific interest yes, in comparing those groups. Yes, this isn't stratified. I, as to my 
knowledge, we think it's not necessary to set a percentage of selection from every group. We can say, for example, 5 from one group, from 5 from second group, 5 from third group, and 5 from fourth group. That would be the second one, the option one. And when we are setting a percentage, then it's proportionate. That the number of people uh, in a group and the representing the number of uh, representative people from the same group will be as per the number of total number of people. So that would be proportionate. Yeah. So for example, ten percent of the people we prefer A. So we will select from the total sample, the total, total sample, yeah. the ten percent of people will be representing the paper A. Yeah. But if we have five papers, <coughs> we are not setting any uh, proportionate the, the number of uh, readers per paper. So we will be selecting, for example, we have 50 sample size, so five new newspapers. So we will select 10 people from each of the group. Yeah. So that would be optimal allocation. That would be optimal allocation because if you're interested in this case in specifically comparing readers of yes. those different newspapers, you want to make sure you've got equal numbers of equal those readers of each in, in your in your group because that allows for a good type of comparison. Yeah. Yeah. But then that won't be maintaining the proportion of the exactly the proportion. Yeah. Of the exactly. Yeah, but you, but it maintains the proportion because you randomly select from the different groups. It maintains the proportions of characteristics within that group. Because uh, I think since you want to compare groups in this case, because you need to have this very specific interest in comparing groups, um, that's fine again because this, this this sample will represent the characteristics of that population. This sample the characteristics of that population. And then if you want to compare those populations to each other, it's um, it's fine. But indeed, your sample that you come up with in entirety doesn't share the characteristics of the entire population research purposes. So, uh, yeah. In uh, let's say we have a small uh, sample size, between stratified and systematic random sampling, which one does uh, give us the best? Can I come to sample sizes now? And, and then that may be answers part of your question. Um, where were we? So yeah, the random stark stuff, that's something we just discussed. Um, in the interest of time, I'm rushing through these a bit because this is basically repeating some of the information that was on the other side. So if you're uh, interested, have a look at that again. And yeah. In one of the slides, you showed me something yeah. Let, let may be discussed because we're getting very close now. And Harris actually sent me an email this morning and said, hey, this is what we did in the Indian election study, which is indeed a combination, if I understand correctly, of it would be worthwhile to, to have him actually explain a little bit what happened. And this is this is the email that is sent in a part of the email. So um, maybe in the what we're going to read it, uh, you can uh, so what, just to answer your question, it depends, uh, the previous question, it depends upon the kind of uh, uh, resources you have, for example, the size of population. It's not possible to know like how many people are reading which newspaper or what news. So you have to really randomly select. And if you are doing, just let me explain, and if you are doing your sampling correctly, then there is... Uh, I, I would say 95% probability that your sampling would be representative of the entire population. And that's what we have seen in our election studies in Bihar, in Delhi, and in West Bengal. It was highly representative of the entire population. Then again, I need to explain to you our pilot study which happened in 2013 Delhi Assembly election. And at that time, we made some mistake. And the mistake was, so let's Going, uh, going back to this uh, 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 PBS sampling, which is proportional to uh, population size, and this is one of the cluster sampling. So first, if you are doing an election study, what you have to do is to first take Lok Sabha constituencies as a starting point, and we know like each Lok Sabha constituency is further divided into assembly constituencies, and within the assembly constituencies, then you have to. Uh, so, first you create a cluster of Lok Sabha uh, constituencies, taking into account India is highly diverse, caste, reserve constituency or unreserved constituencies. And uh, so these demographic factors are very important, rural or urban. And then you take assembly constituencies, again, taking into account all these factor, factors. You are creating a cluster 
cluster of upper caste, lower caste, uh, Muslim dominated constituencies, uh, non Muslim dominated constituencies, and further you have to take into account if you want, for example, New Delhi. Is, uh, or if you want to go to GK, it's the uh, upper middle class constituency. So you have to take all these factors into account when you are creating the cluster. Once your cluster is created, taking into account all your uh, um, uh, variables, or uh, all your research questions, and then you randomly select people from the voter list. So each of the assembly constituency you can take uh, each, uh, I think one assembly constituency has at least 200, any, anything between 200 to 900 polling booths. And out of 900 polling booths or 200 polling booths, we took five. And again, it was a random selection. And out of those uh, five polling booths, we, uh, then we took out a voter list. And from the, uh, from the voter list, we went to every 21st people. So this is again the rand uh, randomization. And just to tell you about our West Bengal study, uh, the, according to the census, 48% female, uh, sorry, uh, election commission data, 48% female, 52% male. Our sample had 47% female and uh, 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 so 53% male. So very close to representative uh, sampling. Again, with STs and STs, we were able to achieve highly, very close to uh, uh, election data, uh, sorry, uh, census data, and similarly with religious group, it was slightly, uh, for example, Muslims uh, were 27% in Bengal, but our sample had 22%. And then tomorrow you are going to discuss about the way. So I not yeah, So uh, so this is how you select. So again, just one minute more to go back to 2013 studies. So in 2013 studies, we created a cluster of district instead of Lok Sabha constituencies. And that's where our sample became completely unrepresentative. So we could not publish anything out of 2013 data in any international journal because, again, if it's not representative, then it's very difficult to publish anything out of that. So that's what we learned in 2013 studies, that you have to really be very careful about your research questions what you want to achieve and um, what is your, uh, uh, what would be your best uh, proportional uh, best sampling methods. So again to uh, uh, come back to your question, if your uh, sampling method is correct, then there is a high probability that it would be representative of your population. Thanks. Yeah, actually, too. <laughs> so it's it's um, interesting you, you see there's different steps of ran random selection involved in this process. So every every step you can make random, you should make random in a way. Um, and why is it done this way? Because probably you didn't have a list of all voters of the country or in the regions that you were interested in. I mean, probably would have been hard to get a list of all eligible voters in, in New Delhi. And that's why you choose these stepwise procedures, still ensuring random random selection and, and some proportional distribution of characteristics. Just to, uh, we had a voter list, but uh, in India, escape is highly diverse currently, caste, yeah. religion, yeah. and um, uh, rural and urban. So all these, so you need to create a cluster of that. For example, some constituencies will be highly dominated by upper class people. On the other hand, the other constituencies constituency will be highly dominated by lower class people. So if you go for randomization from the beginning, there, there is a high probability that all your sampling, uh, cluster, uh, all your constituencies will have to be represented by only upper class people. So that's where we created a cluster of yeah, okay. upper yeah. class uh, constituencies, lower class constituencies, still dominated constituencies, urban constituencies, yeah. rural yeah. constituencies. Um, the important thing is uh, the selection of characteristics that you look at, urbanization, religiosity, religion, discrimination, class, and so on. Of course, that's only a selection of characteristics, but having a good selection of those and having many of those factors being involved in, in, in building your clusters actually tries to ensure that you get a fairly good sample, as in this case was was the case.